Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Mr. Farney Earth Science video. In this video, we are going to talk about the king of planets, the sun. And yes, I know the sun's not a planet. It's a, it's a joke. It's okay. Uh, let's quick refresh a little bit about the sun, specifically stars, just so we can orient ourselves a little bit about our, you know, wonderful celestial friend that keeps us able to live here on this planet. One, stars begin as a nebula. As that nebula begins to kind of rotate and gravity pulls in that gas and dust, that material is going to coalesce. And then once enough of that has combined and temperature gets hot enough for fusion to start, we can then move that star from being a protostar onto the main sequence of our HR diagram. And then right kind of smack dab in the middle is where you'll find our star. It's a very kind of average luminescence, very average temperature about 5,500 degrees Kelvin. So that's kind of where our sun sits on an HR diagram. And we're learning a little bit more about the different layers of the sun and a little bit of information that you should know as we begin to start to wrap up our astronomy unit here. So sun is by far the largest object in our solar system. To put it in size perspective, it would takes about 109 Earths or 10 Jupiters lined up side to side, edge to edge, to fit across the sun. The sun is 330,000 times as massive as the Earth. So it would take 330,000 Earths to fill the inside of the sun if you were to kind of like pop it open. And the sun produces an equivalent of 4 trillion 100, light, 100 watt light bulbs every second. That's how much energy is produced from the sun. That's a lot of light. That's a lot of energy. That's how much radiation is coming out of the sun, the largest object we have. Different layers of the sun. We have the core. That's the center of the sun. It's the hottest layer of fusion takes place. And by hot, we mean it's 15 million Kelvin, which is somewhere in the ballpark of like 29 million Fahrenheit. Really, really hot. The photosphere is the visible surface of the sun. So if you want to think as our crust is our surface, the photosphere is like their surface. And this is where we get the temperature of our sun fit, that we use for the HR diagram. Here it says about 58 HR, we said it was about 5,500 Kelvin. This is where our visible light's emitted from the photosphere. So even though the core is really, really hot, the temperature we use to figure out the color, it comes from the photosphere. It's like the crust or the visible surface of the sun. The chromosphere, that's uh, like the first layer of the atmosphere, if you will, for the sun here. And it's usually only visible during a solar eclipse when the photosphere is being blocked. So it appears red during solar eclipses. We have the corona. It's the outermost layer of the sun's atmosphere. It can only be seen during total solar eclipses. And it's really hot from like one to two million degrees Kelvin, very, very hot. And corona, it kind of sounds like crown. It actually is where they get the name of. It's like the crown of the sun. It's just sitting all around the sun with these kind of like spike-like appendages moving all around it. So the coroner is the outermost layer of the sun. Different types of activity that comes along with it. We got sunspots. They're dark, cooler temperature spots on the surface of the protosphere. It's where regions of the sun's magnetic field will reach the surface of it. So those dark spots that we see here, they are actually cooler sections of the photosphere. That's what's going on there. Sometimes violent eruptions will happen on the surface of the sun. Violent particles kind of spew off and radiate from the surface of the sun. We call them the solar flares that are pictured here. You might have heard of solar flare before. We have this huge kind of just like eruption or expulsion of material and particles from the surface of the sun out in the space. Next, we have solar wind. This is gas coming off the corona, going out in all directions in space. Very, very high energy charged particles. Because of our magnetic field of our planet it helps to protect us from a lot of these solar wind. So that way we don't get damaged here on the surface. We just see a lot of that aurora borealis going on because of our ionosphere protecting us from those charged particles. So thank you very much, Earth Magnetic Field, for that. A couple last little things where uh, from the surface of the sun here, one's called a prominence, pictured left here. It's an arc of gas that's ejected from the chromosphere and it rains back down to the surface. So whereas a solar flare just kind of bursts off into space, 
a prominence will kind of arc up and then back down to the surface here. So not quite flaring all the way out in the space, just kind of arcing out and then back down. And then these really long, dark things on the right picture that almost look like scars, they're called filaments. They're long, dark, thread-like objects. And they occur from roughly around the same region prominence is four from. So that's where we see filaments, filaments, prominences. Here's a really good infographic section of the sun, infographic layer. Uh, we have our inner layers, the core, the radiative zone, where our magnetic radiation begins to kind of come through. We have our light that's trying to come out of the radiative zone, but because of how dense the radiative zone is, it takes a really long period of time for light photons to kind of begin to project out of the radiative zone to the surface. Thousands and thousands of years it takes to go through that surface, these, uh, those light photons. We have our convection zone, that's where we have hot material rising, cooler material sinking within the inner layer of the sun. And then we reach our first outer layer, the photosphere. This is where we're gonna get the temperature of the sun. It's visible from earth. The chromosphere is next. It kind of has that, you know, darker odd looking color kind of intermixed with the orangeness of the sun. And then we have the corona, which is like that almost rated crown that we have see kind of showing off the sun here. Uh, what's really cool about this picture is if you, if you look at the top right, there's a little blue dot with the earth. That's supposed to represent the earth, a little blue dot, to kind of put it in comparison size with the sun. And I don't even believe this is to scale. I think that earth much, much smaller than what that blue dot actually is. So it's a really good picture there showing that. Uh, some information about solar activity that comes along with the sun. There are sunspot cycles. So the number of spot sunspots changes every year within this like 11 year cycle when the Earth's, the sun's magnetic field reverses, there's like a flare up in solar radiation. The next maximum that is predicted is about, you know, it's in 2024. So we'll get some really strong auroras when we have that solar flare flare up. Uh, and sometimes it can mess up with communications and GPS devices because those satellites are in space, but I think our technology has gotten a, a lot better at handling uh, solar flare flare ups. We already know what's going on in the inside of our sun. We have nuclear fusion where the density is so high, it's actually combining our hydrogen molecules into helium. And then through that combination as a way of maintaining stability, that new helium uh, particle will release radiation to kind of help it stay in equilibrium. So we already know what fusion is from our star section there. Here's what's going on at a couple of our interior layers. Uh, our radiative zone, this is where energy radiates outwards from the core. It takes a long time for that energy to go through the radiative zone. Like I said, thousands and thousands of years. Then it reaches the convection zone, which just kind of helps just regulate the overall temperature of the sun so it doesn't get too, too hot. So our convection zone is a means of helping us to maintain equilibrium, where our warm material will rise, it'll be cooled by kind of the vacuum chill of space, and then the cooler material will sink back down to the bottom of the convection zone. So this convection is a means of temperature regulation within the sun, very, very important. There's a couple links to some videos that you'll wanna take a look at. Uh, you can find these links in our Google slide notes itself. One's about the solar cycle, solar storms, and one about the aurora. So three really good videos. And then we'll just finish off with a very quick discussion here about the formation of our solar system. You'll see here there are five steps, one, two, three, four, five. And on the next slide, there are numbered one, two, three, four, five, beginning with our interstellar cloud. A star forms and it begins to spin energy. We get these small things called planetesimals forming. It's like the very, very, very early form of planets. So they're just kind of large rocky materials. And then once enough material coalesces and combines together, we can call them protoplanets. And then the last step, debris from other solar system materials begin to you know, take the shape of moons and stuff like that around our planets here. So we have five steps, one, two, three, four, five on this slide. 
And then the five steps here, one, two, three, four, five, that kind of go along with it. So again, number one, we have our interstellar cloud. Gravity begins kind of condensing in on it. So some of that material starts to form. Two, a star forms from spinning energy. That's what we get here. We get kind of like the beginning formation of our star, our sun. So this is like the tail end of like the protostar step. And then we're able to start to put our dude on main sequence, like number two to number three. Number three, so we've got planetesimals forming. These are these really tiny rock objects starting to orbit around the center point of our sun. Four protoplanets form, meaning there's enough material that's coalesced or come together to form very early planets. And then the last step, uh, any remaining debris that we have will begin orbiting uh, the planets in the form of moons. So that's all we have for our sun and nebular theory notes here. If you have any questions, please go ahead, ask. Now have a good rest of your day and I'll see you guys next time.